Jerry's got his hand in the air, and when as soon as the arm goes down, let the games begin. Good morning. Welcome to Grace Gospel Fellowship. Appreciate those of you coming out. Uh, we've had kind of a weather event here in Chicagoland, but it doesn't stop the crew, it doesn't stop us. The living word of God goes out from this pulpit, rain or shine. You know something? The sun is always shining in heaven. You know? And the sun is always shining with us. The lamb is the light thereof. I'll better keep my powder dry, and I'll let Charlie start things off with a word of prayer. Thank you, Brother Jan. Dearest Father, it's Abba Father, our Father, and Avi, my Father. We thank you, as always, for your love, which is unconditional. For you loved us even when we were sinners, even when we, even when we were the sons of the disobedience. We were children of wrath, and in fact, we were your enemy. But Christ came to save the whole human race, and at the cross, he shed his blood to take away all of our sins and to reconcile us to you. And we who are of faith were resurrected with Christ to a new and living way. And as we walk in Christ, because we live in him, and we thank you, Father, that it's your love that completely surrounds us and enfolds us and lives inside of us and continually transforms us to be like your son, Christ Jesus our Lord. And we thank you for that in his precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charlie. Well, that was a wonderful prayer. Before I start my message, I want to deliver a message from Michael Heiser. Um, I don't know when he wrote this, but it showed up on his feed today. It's a, it's a well, I'll just read it. It says, you were not saved to perpetuate a subculture. You were not saved to perpetuate a movement. You were not saved to perpetuate some denomination. Your focus should be on your individual walk with the Lord, trying to do something for the kingdom of God, which is not of this world and is not tied to political structures or cultural structures or anything like that. But what can you do to do something positive there as often as possible through the course of your life? Have that as your focus, the people around you. And don't live for movement level stuff. It's completely unnecessary. And if you understand what he's getting at, it should be very liberating for those of you struggling with that kind of thinking of groups and clans and culture. We're not of this world, of this system anymore. It's an entirely new way of living. And the approach to God is entirely different now. That's what I've been meditating on all week. The approach is entirely different now. Different from what? The old system required sacrifice, blood. The wages of sin is death. Sweat of your brow. Labor. And all while separated from God. And it was sin consciousness 24-7. The constant need for sacrifice. Whether it was your sweat, your blood, sweat, and tears. Whether it was your animals. You were constantly reminded of death. You were living in death under that old system. God was keeping us alive, but that was not living, folks. When Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have that life in abundance, he's talking about new life in him, not just being alive while you're dead. Now, the longed-for sacrifice has been made. 
that which the law required was perfectly satisfied by Christ on our behalf. The approach to God is entirely different now. No longer shrouded in shameful guilt do we present our puny offering of sweat and toil for inspection in fear of certain rejection and judgment. We now come to a court of a loving, welcoming Father and Lord, no longer a court of law, but a courtyard of the garden of life. It's an entirely different approach to God now. It's different because now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh, are made close by the blood of Christ. Now, we're no longer following Jesus. We're abiding in him. We're abiding with him. We're living with him. He is alive in us and we are alive in him with a new life, an always new life, being renewed constantly. The Jews followed God, the cloud, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, the tabernacle. They were followers of God and God was leading them. Physically leading them. But the approach is entirely different now. We're really not following him. We're not separate from him. He was in the tent. Jews were in the camp. They would follow him. And then Messiah was there. And they would follow him. It's not even an approach anymore. He came, died, came back alive, and left. Because only then, seated and finished, could he send another comforter. The Holy Spirit of God, he sends to fill you, to never leave you or forsake you. And that spirit is a transformative spirit. You're not following that spirit. You're becoming that spirit. Six closer than a brother. And because the work is finished, the sin paid for, he can send another comforter. Basically, it's another him. It's his spirit. We were reading chapter 20 and John at the, during the Honey on the Slate. And I mentioned a little about this last week when we were talking about the two angels that Mary saw in the tomb and how that was a picture of the Ark of the Covenant with the two angels on the mercy seat that sat atop the box that held the presence of God, that had the Aaron's rod, the manna, and the tablets that the Ten Commandments were written on. And that's where the priest would sprinkle the blood once a year, the Day of Atonement. And that's also where the two angels were witnessing the blood facing each other and the glory of God would manifest between the angels and speak to the high priest. The Shekinah glory originated there and would radiate out from that holy place, the mercy seat. 
and that is the actual fulfillment of that or where that originates is the empty tomb, the slab where Jesus laid, where he came resurrected, the two angels sitting there, his blood, his death, his blood on that altar or on that slab of stone that he was laid on. They witnessed him come back to life. They witnessed the blood. They watched him come back to life, those angels. Those are the ones that God told Moses, I want you to make it exactly like the pattern that I show you. His pattern that he was using was 1,500 years in the future, but it didn't matter. God knew it already. He says, make it just like this. So Mary is the first one to the tomb, sees the stone rolled away. She sees the two angels in there. In her mind, where have they taken him? She doesn't know those guys are angels. She didn't know Jesus was Jesus. He's the gardener, she thought. He was the gardener. She's upset and weeping. She was very close to Jesus. She's the one that had the seven demons cast out of her. She financially supported him in a big way. And now his body's been taken, she thinks. And she's crying. She's weeping. First of all, they didn't see the death coming. So then the one that they loved the most, who loved them the most, is brutally taken from them, humiliated, tortured, and suffered horribly and died. Their highest point of their life became the lowest point of their life. This all came crashing down. How could this happen? This man who did all these miracles and healed us. What? She's weeping. Let's read John 20. Start at chapter, I mean, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, outside the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down, looked into the sepulcher, and seeing two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain, they said unto her, Why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they've taken away my Lord. and I know not where they have laid him. And when she says that, she turns back and she sees Jesus standing there and knew not that it was Jesus. We don't really know why she didn't know. Those guys on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him either. Maybe they hadn't seen him and maybe they, he transformed himself differently. Maybe it's because he was now resurrected and healthy, looked different. Most likely he concealed himself because it was a, when he showed them all the scriptures that were written, that's when their eyes began to be opened. And so when he joined them for, for the meal, he break bread, all of a sudden everything they had learned about the scriptures came into play and went, oh my God. So Mary, she didn't recognize him and we don't really know physically why she didn't. But it doesn't matter. She didn't recognize him. The point is, he, he says unto her, why weepest thou? He probably heard the angels asking her. She didn't answer them. Suitably enough, she says, well, because they took my master, my Lord, away. Okay. He asks again. He repeats the question. This all happens like within seconds. 
Why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Another question. She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, well, just a second before, she presumes he's a gardener. Well, she's in a garden. So that could be logical. But it's Jesus in a garden. Where did this whole thing start, folks? In the garden. Nothing wrong with connecting Jesus with the Garden of Eden, right? Well, traditionally, kings have great gardens. Kings have, um, and the gods, little g, they like mountains. The Garden of Eden was, was in a mountain. You have mountain, river, gardens, beautiful. The views are fantastic. Skiing is good. Just kidding, but kings and gardeners are sometimes, it can mean the same thing. Some gardeners are known, like we think of the hanging gardens of Babylon. There is a thing about, about gardens and, and um, courtyards and things. Think of the, like in the UK, all of their palaces and those big wealthy peoples, all the estates of the royalty. And they had courtyards and great gardens all over the place. So you have gardeners and kings are thought of in, a lot of, in the same ways. We think of the gardener as the hired hand, the landscaper. Uh, take it up a notch, a few notches. And you can see there's an you know, equivalency there of the way royalty likes to present itself. So here's Jesus in the garden. She thinks he's the gardener. She says, if, if you have borne him, if you have taken him away, tell me where he, he, you has, have laid him, and I will take him away. And I like the fact that here's a lady who says, I'll take him away. A fully grown man, she's going to take him away. Well, it's, we don't know who else was with her at that time. A couple of the other gals were there. But those are in other gospel accounts. This is just what John says. But she was wealthy. When you're wealthy, she says, I'll take, I'll, I'll handle this. I got this. Because she can have somebody or people, you know. She could make things happen. I'll take them away. But so what is the two questions Woman, why weepest thou? Well, there's two approaches. That's a different one now. The old approach to God, that was scary. Because no matter what our offering was, whether it was our efforts, whether it was our animals, whatever was required, we're always on eggshells. What if I didn't do it exactly right? And even with your best offering, when you do it right, it didn't remove the sin. It just bought you time. Another day, another festival, another year with, with the high priest, with your lambs. All it's, all, all it's doing is you're satisfying a legal requirement, but it didn't change you at all. You're still in the guilt of your sins. You just bought, an, bought some more time. Staying alive. But are you really living? If you're still plagued with guilt of your sin, death and dying, held captive through fear of death all your life because of sin, not even your actions or lack of actions. Sin, the noun, resides in you. Enough to drive you crazy. Trying to do everything exactly right. Because you can't. So I could see there would be a lot of 
when you're, you know, that sin consciousness, being under the law, never being able to perfectly do it right, always being reminded year in, year out about your sin, and the fear of death. You're going to die. That's really a life of mourning, isn't it? M O U R N I N G. But there's a whole different approach to God now, there's a whole different relationship with Him now. All of those laws of the sacrificial priesthood system were there for a purpose, for a season, if you will, until the actual perfect sacrifice was made, the one that would cause all of that to go away. You're done now. This, it's over. We don't, we don't do this anymore because the one satisfactory sacrifice was made. The perfect sacrifice, if you will, that God was completely, perfectly satisfied with. He himself crafted it. He himself died on that cross. His blood was applied to that, in that tomb. No longer the blood of bulls and goats. Psalm 30, verse 11 and 12. Thou hast turned for me my mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth. Now, well, we don't talk about sackcloth these days. A sackcloth. It's a burlap bag, folks. It's the cheapest fabric that you can get. Why, why would anybody wear sackcloth? Sackcloth and ashes is symbolic of mourning and fasting. You know, you've, seen, you've been to some funerals and there's traditional mourning clothes that certain cultures would wear for a funeral, the way they would present themselves. Like, we wear black at funerals, right? It was common to wear sackcloth. Sackcloth was cheap clothes. They would also tear, rent, rent their clothes when they were distraught, upset, or mourning, the grief. They would rent their clothes, tear them. And they would put ashes on their face. Rub, it, rub the ashes up to, to dirty themselves to make them not look happy. They would exaggerate their grief with a demonstration by wearing sackcloth and ashes. Thou hast put off my sackcloth. Thou, God, has put off your sackcloth and girded me with gladness. When you're girded, you've, you've wrapped your robe up around you so that you can move swiftly and dance. If you don't tie it right and you're dancing and your robe might be flopping around, just saying, you want to be sure you tie it right so people don't see stuff under there. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Not mourning, gladness. To the end that my glory, my glorying in this may sing praise unto thee and not be silent. Oh God, my Lord, I will give thanks to thee forever. Can we say that? Amen. We can, we do, we ought to. Two approaches, two kinds of tears. Turn my mourning into dancing. Happy tears. Do we, when we saw the Collinsworth family singing the, my uh, tribute, my test, what is it, my tribute, I think, to God be the glory, with that family, and they're all singing loud and proud with their harmonies, and Kim's gorgeously accompanying them on the piano. They were all entering in. They're all in the presence of God. That made me get verklempt. Those are tears of joy. I was thinking this morning, I've got this Jesus in me that has changed my life, changed my heart, 
changed my relationship with everybody that I meet and know, or ever did know, or ever will know, put, set me on a high place. He's turned my mourning into dancing. And I don't know how to explain it effectively to anybody. I try up here. But it's like trying to... It's like trying to take Niagara Falls and squirt it at you with a garden hose. It's so much bigger inside of us. And it's so, it's so eternal life, it's, we can't even begin to get a handle on it. And that spirit, it's just urging me. It's bursting out. And I look at that Collingsworth family as an example, because there's countless of them. And I go, they understand it. They've got the same Jesus. Look at them. That's one of the reasons that I, I play these various videos here of these different, you know, artists, whether they're known or unknown, to see the exquisiteness of their gifts. And especially when I think about the Jehovah Shalom a cappella guys from Uganda, with their freakishly precise, intricately tuned harmonies, how they sing together like a one person, but they're in such precise, exacting timing and harmony. It's like death by a thousand paper cuts. It's like, you're killing me, guys. It's so gorgeous. And they're so beautiful, the way that their, their antics and their miming and their presentation of it and the way they smile. And the, That's not normal. That's not ordinary. That's something supernatural made that, made those guys the way they can do that. And how it all came together. They have the technology to be able to record them that way. And they've got some good camera people who are producing it so that you, so they're just free to flow and be beautiful. What was that, Michael? What did Michael I just say? You were saved. Your focus should be on your individual walk with the Lord. And don't live for m movement level stuff. Have as your focus the people around you. Live dynamically, live authentically with the people around you. They've never met anyone else like you. And if they have, it's like me looking at the Collingsworths. And I go, that, they know that Jesus that I know, that I'm struggling to get out, to be able to articulate, to be able to share, to have them come out of my fingers and out of my mouth and out of my camera and out of whatever, out of the pulpit here. They know him. You know family when you see him. Well, if your friends don't know Jesus, you are the one that they know. You be Jesus to them. You've got his spirit, folks. You've got the new approach. No sweat. No guilt. Mary, oh boy, let's read 2017. Let go a little bit further. Jesus says under Mary, she turns to herself again and she says unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, Master. Jesus says unto her, Touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my Father. And Anna, I did a little more looking into that. I think maybe I can help explain it. Anna is asking a really smart question. She is known to do. Uh, it's at our Honey on the Slate. Touch me not. You've all read it, and you've all wondered, what the heck does he mean? Touch me not. I haven't yet ascended to the, to the Father. 
Well, I'll inject some of my thoughts because as a young man, when I first encountered that, it's like, okay, he's being like beamed up. He's being, he was dematerialized, he's rematerializing in a different form or something. Yeah, I look, it looks like I'm here, but I'm a hologram right now. Don't, don't be touching me. It won't be good. You cannot stand this level of energy that's happening here, like on Star Trek. You know, beam me up. Something. Don't touch me. No, it's not what it was. Don't cling to me. That's what it means. Don't cling to me. He says, touch me not for I'm, or don't cling to me. I'm not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father. But the point is, he told her, don't be clinging to me. She was clinging to him. She realizes it is him and he's come alive again from her worst day to her best day in a few seconds. Probably, she's probably on her knees wrapping her arms around his knees. Just don't be clinging to me. He's not one to reject affection. He meant something else. I see a couple things here. Number one, go tell my disciples. Tell them. Don't be, don't be here doing this. Also, well, Mary was clinging to his flesh body. His physical body. Remember, Jesus is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. She was clinging to the one she knew after the flesh. Is that what we're supposed to do? She was desiring to retain the experience on earth in physical matter. She didn't want him to die. Now that she's got him back from, she's, oh, fantastic, this is it. We got you back. No, 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 no. Things, it's a different approach now. God has something much better in store. But we must not cling to this world, even the physical Jesus, the Son of Man. His life has changed and will change incredibly more so when he ascends and returns to the glory from whence he came. Our life in Christ is about to change incredibly from the familiar, dense, mortal, material realm to that of spirit in Christ. It's all part of of the new approach. In millennium time, I just made that up, or cosmic time, I'm just going to have to let your mind expand to try to imagine what that could possibly mean. What separates Alpha and Omega Remember, Alpha and Omega, the Greek alphabet, the first and the last letters. It means beginning and end. God is the beginning and the end, simultaneously. The one who was, who is, and is to come, all at the same time. So in this millennium time, in cosmic time, what separates the beginning, Alpha, from the Omega, and what's, what separates them chronologically, however many measures of units of time that you want to interposed there to satisfy however far apart you think the beginning is from the end? What separates Alpha and Omega chronologically, chronologically cannot separate them at all as they are, he 
is one. Did that make your brain just sort of flop over and say, I can't do this, I can't go there, I don't know why you just did that. You can't separate the end from the beginning. He's outside of time, folks. It was fresh when the angels beheld Jesus resurrecting and God instructed Moses, make it just like this. If this just happened, Moses, do it just exactly like this. It's 1,500 years apart. For God, easy. His son dying, not so easy. That death, that wound, is an eternal wound that he bears forever. So chronologically, you cannot separate them at all because they're one. Thus, significant moments in Jesus' earth ministry, those few years, those three years of his ministry, they were accomplished in God's sight in the virtual blink of an eye. How... Come on, folks. How long is the saga from the Bible? Jesus was 2,000 years ago. Moses was 1,500 years before that. He got 3,500 years. And then who knows how long I've been screwing around trying to get it together before that. So what is the three years of Jesus' ministry in that time frame? And then if you're the Alpha and Omega and you were there at the creation and now you're there in the book of Revelation in heaven and everything's hallelujah fantastic. And it's all compressed together into one experience. Blink of an eye. Matthew 16, 13 through 18. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And I say, Well, some say, Thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he says, yeah, but who do you guys say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou, Peter, that thou art, you art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we think it's easy to connect Petros with the rock. Petros, Peter. Petros, like petrified, it means rock. And probably most of the church thinks that that's what it is, especially Rome. I don't think that's what it is. But I think the rock first of all, the rock is represented as God in the wilderness with Moses and the rock where the water came out. So we see life inside of stone, law, stone. God could break it, boom, gushes out. And then the second time around where they still didn't have water again, and God says, go speak to the rock. 
And then Moses strikes the rock, and that was the sin that kept him from entering into the promised land. But inside the stone of the law, the hardness of the earth, there is life in there. God said, speak to it. A different approach. Moses didn't. Oops. And now here's Jesus saying, upon this rock, I will build my church. Well, where were they? They were in Caesarea Philippi, at the base of the mountain. Well, let me go a little bit further. Um, in Matthew 17, 1 through 8, and after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into a high mountain. Some people think it's Mount Tabor, but that's nowhere near Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi right there is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon, today, great skiing. It's a big ski lodge up there. International destination for tourism. Beautiful skiing, beautiful scenery. And beautiful snow. Well, remember, who likes mountains? The gods like the mountains. And that area on Mount Hermon is where you had um, these um, cults would worship there. Um, you had uh, temples to Pan there, the Greek and Zeus were, was there. Um, so these were not holy places. They were worshiping these cults. Baal worship was going on on Mount Hermon. Now, if you think about it, where, where did uh, the Muslims build their, uh, their temple? On the Temple Mount, where the Jews' temple was. It's there right now. Right, they built it right over. It's offensive. They were basically giving the Jews the middle finger. But they didn't. Well, you know, Satan is an imposter. He doesn't have an original bone in his body. So he remembers the garden. He likes the mountains too. And so he was there trying to get there first. Well, the uh, Canaanite literature, from ancient Canaanite literature, identifies that area on Mount Hermon as being the gates of hell because of the kind of worship that was going on there. That's where Jesus was standing. This is a good place to build the church. And when it says the gates of hell will not prevail, it's an unfortunate translation. Because it sounds like that's prevailing against the church. He's in opposition to the church. Oh, we can take the heat because God's on our side. Don't worry, little children. It won't prevail. He will not prevail. No. It's putting him on defense, not us. means the, the gates of hell cannot withstand the church. We dominate there. With the Edenic mandate in the beginning to Adam was be fruitful, multiply, dominate the earth, overspread the earth, be fruitful, multiply, make the whole place a garden. It's yours. 
Well, Satan wanted that authority, and he, he usurped it, the usurper. Why don't we just take it right there? Let's start right there at the gates of hell and take that. Make that his tomb. Satan's tomb. It's got a nice ring to it. Interesting thing that ha happened there. If you look in Matthew 17... Verse 2. After he said, we're going to build the church here, and the devil won't be able to withstand it, they ta he takes him up to the high mountain, up, 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 on Mount Hermon. And he was transfigured there before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. They see Jesus turn into a light being right before their eyes. And they saw something else. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Like Heiser says, if it's weird, it's important. When he's talking about the scriptures, that's weird. But why not? Now think about this. Moses and Elijah, they both had a theophany. They both saw God. Um, do I have those? Well, let's just make it short. Moses was up on Mount Sinai, and God would let him see him, but not his face. And he hid him in the cleft of the rock. So God experienced the glory of God seeing it. And Elijah wanted to see God. And he saw a whirlwind, but God wasn't in it. He saw, heard a noise or something, and God wasn't in it. He heard all this sensational stuff. But then he heard a still, small voice speaking to him. That was God. Moses heard, saw this trembling, smoking thing. With the, he passed by. He's got to hide in the rock because it's all fierce and powerful. Those are two different approaches. It's the same God. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. What was the message of the prophets? Messiah is coming. Thou hast turned for me my morning into dancing. Prophecy. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Give you hope in the future. Prophecy. Yes, it happened to Israel, but 200 years after the prophet said it. But that's a picture of Jesus. Now here... They see Jesus glorified, a light being talking with Moses and Elijah in another realm. They're beholding this. Jesus with the law on one side and the prophets on the other side, they're having a conversation. And then they disappeared. Now they're just standing there with Jesus. So are we. Matthew 17, verse 3. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter 
and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Did you ever read any of those stories which I take with kind of a grain of salt, people who died and went to heaven and then came back to talk about it, and none of them wanted to come back? Well, if I was Peter, and I see this happening, oh, it's good, let's just stay here. I'll build a, t a tent for each of you guys. Let's, just, let's stay here. I like this. I would too. But it gets better than that. Yeah, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Not the law, not the prophets. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them. It's a new approach. And said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. We see no law, no prophet, but we see one man only. You already have what you need. You already have a man. You have Jesus Christ. You have his spirit in you. You have been made perfect and complete in him, lacking no good thing. Hebrews 1 First two verses. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. That's all you need, folks, is Jesus. Now, Getting ready to close here, I think. The transfiguration, where they saw him up on, on the mountain, and they saw Moses and Elijah. Forty days later, Jesus is crucified. And he's in the tomb for three days. He's resurrected, and 40 days later, he's ascended. The transfiguration foreshadowed the church. It foreshadowed the ascension, going, leaving the earth, leaving this realm, being in the spirit realm with the Father, being transformed into light, not a physical body like we have here. It'll still be you. Have your gifts, your talents, your fingerprint. But it's not, limit, it's not held back by death. It's not in a dead, by, dead, dying body, flesh body. It doesn't get tired. It doesn't get sick. No more tears. He has spoken to us by his Son. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all, with open face, not veiled like Moses' face, like the law, with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Moses saw the glory of the Lord. Elijah saw the glory of the Lord. John saw the glory. He says, we all beheld his glory. We have seen the glory through his word and by his spirit in you. Nobody gets saved without having a supernatural testimony because being saved is not of this world. Being a Christian is nothing that the world gives you. It's because of the testimony of witnesses it's because of the love of God. It's because of your own personal time encountering Jesus 
where he opens up, reveals your sins, takes them away, loves you, never, stay, never leaves, stays with you forever, changes you, fills you with his spirit. It's not of this world. It's a supernatural thing. Beholding that, remembering that, it transforms you. You are changed into the same image. The more you behold the words of God, the more you behold Him in your mind and your prayers, and you seek those things which are above, not the things on the earth. You feed off of His emanation. You become that. You are transformed by that power. That spirit in you comes more and more alive, displaces the carnal impulses, displaces the news of the world and the cares of the world and all the crap that's going on here. Your emotions are cool, calm, and collected. You have power. You dominate wherever you are with love and peace and grace. The morning is gone. It's time to dance, time to move with him. When you dance, do your senses tingle? Then take a chance while the lonely mingle with circumstance. It's a Neil Young song. He says, when you dance, I can really love. Now, I heard Jesus back in 1969 when I was listening to that album constantly, or 70, whatever it was. But that word being changed into the same image from glory to glory 